Hello and welcome to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. As you might have guessed, this show is about Haskell, which is a purely functional programming language. I'm your host, Dustin Seegers, and I'm an engineer here at IT Pro TV. Hi, I'm Cody Goodman. I'm a senior engineer here at IT Pro TV. Uh, what are we talking about today, Dustin? We're talking about game development in Haskell. I thought it would be cool to um, kind of bring together my love of game development and games, video games in general and Haskell, which is what I use daily here at IT Pro TV. I was going to, I ha actually have a few questions for you, and I figured it would be cool to kind of just look into the, uh, the Haskell game dev uh, community and space and see what all was out there. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people are in your position. Um, you know, if you browse the Haskell subreddit, you'll see occasionally questions about uh, people wanting to make games and people frustrated trying to make games. Uh, so if, if you don't take the right path, it can be pretty frustrating. Um, one recommendation I've, I've seen over the years and tried a little myself is to start out with a 2D library called Gloss. Gotcha. Have you ever heard of it? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, our, our lead engineer, I think he did a few um, just very basic games using mm -hmm. Gloss. Um, I heard it was super intuitive and quick to uh, get something up on the screen. Right, right. Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I recommend it, and I think a lot of other people recommend it, is uh, you can you can draw a window and draw a circle and a single line, and it's all in you know, plain English words that you, you might be able to guess yourself. <laughs> nice. You know, Gloss is really aimed at simplicity. There's a ton of tutorials available, uh, not just like basic tutorials, but tutorials of, you know, how do you make Pong? Oh, yeah. Right. It's uh, more of an end to end thing, which Haskell's sorely lacking in other areas. Uh, but when you're just getting started and it's a new paradigm, a new language, you you need you need a little bit of hand holding to just get all the way from point A to point B at least. Exactly. At least once. Mm -hmm. So that's it. So gloss seems really attractive to me in that aspect, um, mainly because I'm not super um, proficient in Haskell. I've only been doing it for a little while. Uh, but um, I do enjoy it, and I think I have more experience um, in game development, mainly as a hobby, uh, right? Versus you know, programming in Haskell. So mm -hmm. I would like to to merge both of them, and uh, Gloss seems like a pretty good, pretty good way to do that. Yeah, and for people trying to merge their game development experience or or interest and their love of Haskell, you'll probably run into uh, functional reactive programming, which even if you are really proficient in Haskell, it can be a bit of a, a mind bender to wrap your head around that. Gotcha. Yeah, I actually, um, just doing a little bit of research before this podcast, we stumbled upon um, uh, FRP, functional reactive programming, and then also uh, just your classic main uh, iterating over your main game loop. Um, and uh, do you have any, like, I guess a concise way, if you could, <laughs> uh, explain functional reactive programming to those um, who don't know. I, uh, I didn't come up with the best answer myself, but I, I looked around and uh, hope I say the name right here. Tikhan Jelvis mm -hmm. has a, a talk on uh, answering that that question. You, know, gotcha. you have to have a whole talk to answer it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But he, he says, if I had to summarize it in one sentence, I would say that... Functional reactive programming is programming with time varying values. Um, now, that's not the most satisfying answer for someone who might already be overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. But it basically, that's uh, for lack of anything better to use at this moment, uh, it's, it's state, right? Like, it's yeah. a way to represent state? Yeah, it, it's a lot like state. The So, it still encodes the information that state would encode. Uh, the difference would be that uh, the way that these things compose together are different. Uh, we won't get too deep into that, and mm -hmm. that's one of the reasons we recommend gloss to start out with. Yeah. Um, so you can just you know gloss over FRP. <laughs> I got you. I see what you did there. <laughs> okay, cool. So do we have any like games that may have used FRP? Any examples of that, or off the top of your head? Yeah. Or any packages that might uh, implement or use this? Yeah, a recent, a recent really cool game with a, an interesting premise that uh, we might recognize uh, the roots of is PeopleMon. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did see that. 
I believe it was by uh, Alex Stewart. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Right, right. And uh, so the premise is that you you catch people and, and battle with them uh, <laughs> in the style of Pokemon. Ah, uh, gotcha. That's pretty funny. Yeah, I did. Uh, I got I got a chance to at least um, watch the little trailer for it and go to the site, but I have not yet played it. I plan to play it. Mm-hmm. Uh, here it's it's pretty short, but it looks pretty entertaining at the very least. <laughs> Oh, and I, I recommend at least check out their homepage. There's some pretty hilarious <laughs> images on there. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, let's see. So, Peepamon, what was it based on? It was uh, Yampa, I think. Okay. Uh, which is an FRP library. Um, you'll notice that the more complex examples of Haskell games use FRP. Uh, I think we had an exception which used a classic game loop, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but just to answer why these libraries might prefer FRP as, as complexity scales up, uh, FRP seems to have some advantages over the classic game loop, much in the way that Haskell has advantages over imperative languages. Oh yeah, that actually reminds me, Cody. Um, we will be linking the package Yampa as well as Peoplemon and other things mentioned in this podcast on our Haskell Weekly podcast page. So, if cool. you're, um, you know, interested in, you know, finding these, not really having to Google them, even though you totally can, uh, we'll have those links available at the Haskell Weekly podcast page. But the mention of Peoplemon and then also Pokemon, which is a, a mainstream game, I w- found out just uh, a little while ago that there was actually a Haskell game that was greenlit on Steam. Now, they've retired the whole green light thing on Steam, but so this is a little bit older, um, but it was still pretty cool to see that, I think it was even back in 2012, right. that people were using Haskell to create games, and yeah. they actually you know, were, were getting somewhere with it. Trailblazers, for sure. Uh, that was Nikki and the Robots. And uh, I remember watching on excitedly on their development blog and uh, tracking their progress, uh, trying to get everything building myself. It was exciting. And then to see that they got on Steam Greenlight, it was like, wow, so in 2012, it's possible to write a Haskell game if you put in enough effort and get it greenlit on Steam. That's actually really cool. Yeah. I noticed that um, I went to their page and I did a little, uh, a little snooping around. And I saw that their tech stack consisted of Hipmunk, which is... Like oh, a, the physics engine, right? Yeah. It's um, the Haskell take on Chipmunk, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. Um, it looks like the package is now deprecated, uh, so it might be a little old. But it was still nice and cool to see that, you know, the community is out there and mm-hmm. they're doing things with it. You, you know, I, I rewatched the Nikki and the Robots video after after uh, looking around for some examples, and uh, it just made me think, you know, what would it take to revive Nikki and the Robots and make it something compiling, something that people, uh, for instance, in this podcast who heard about this could go and download the source code and try mm-hmm. it out. You know, how much work is it to, to update that? Uh, there was an older FPS game made in Haskell. I can't recall the name of it, but somebody did the work to, like, bring it current. Oh, wow. It was really cool. Nice. So, Maybe somebody, maybe me, maybe you, or someone hearing this can try to revive Nikki and the robots. <laughs> right. And it's also just, it would be good to, I guess, have um, something else to do to merge these, I guess, these hobbies and this love of Haskell together, and which would help progress, you know, my skill in Haskell as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's like another... Right. Another bonus and for doing this. On, on the topic of that, there's also Dino Rush, which, uh, you know, if you're wanting to merge your hobbies of Haskell and uh, game development, but you're kind of new, you might want to use like a classic game loop. Mm-hmm. And Dino Rush actually went that route and they used a classic game loop. So, I highly recommend anyone who wants to do that to check out their blog post that I think you're probably going to put in the resources too. Yes. Um, download the source code, get it building, poke around in there. Nice. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> I actually <laughs> went to the page earlier and checked it out, and it's it's pretty cool. I like the uh, the pixel art 
for the game. It looks pretty right. Pretty nice. And and for context, uh, their their game Dino Rush. It's uh, you know when you lose internet connection on uh, Google Chrome. Yes, there's a little dinosaur <laughs> yeah. jumping over stuff. I think we have a high score board somewhere around <laughs> in the office. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I remember that day. <laughs> uh, those examples are pretty inspiring, Cody. Uh, but if I get lost, um, how could I get support? Right. You know, we were talking about Nikki and the robots and their trailblazers. There wasn't, there weren't really a lot of people trying to do Haskell game dev back then, so they had to figure out all those things themselves. But then, at some point past that, they started a, or someone started a subreddit uh, called r slash haskell game dev and they made a wiki of how to get started uh, now they're getting started i think is uh more fitted to complex games and i would still recommend using gloss to get started since it'll will get you up and running the fastest uh but some really good resources there uh, they also have a haskell game dev channel on freenode if you're familiar with irc chat and uh, you can usually get pretty quick help in the Haskell chat room. I'm guessing the Haskell game dev is similar. Um, then there's always Stack Overflow. Uh, I've noticed quite a few game dev questions in Haskell get answered on Stack Overflow. Gotcha. Nice. Yeah, I'll definitely give those a shot. Um, and just to clarify, uh, somebody coming from, let's say, Unity 3D, uh, developing there, there's nothing like that currently for the Haskell community, right? Like, uh, it's basically C sharp for the most part in right. Uh, Unity. Right. Uh, yeah, nothing as complete as Unity. Um, there is a, a game engine that I think attempted to be something like Unity called Helm that you might want to take a look at. Uh, I think it still compiles the latest GHC and is, is working. Um, couldn't find any good game examples of it, though. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Thanks for being on the show with me today, Cody. No problem. It's uh, been a lot of fun. And thank you for listening to the Haskell Weekly Podcast. If you liked what you heard, find out more at our website, haskellweekly.news. Also, please rate and review us on iTunes. It helps a lot. Haskell Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV, the tech skills development platform for IT professionals. And also our employer. Yeah, that too. So send your sysadmins and network admins to www.itpro.com. TV for all of their learning needs. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again next week.